Thank you. Thank you. It's lovely. Um, I was here last night with a different congregation and uh, said it was, uh, it was a privilege to be here, although it was pretty wet last night and uh, the sun's come out this morning. Isn't that great? So uh, lovely to be with you and uh, to get to know some of you. Um, hopefully afterwards uh, when we can chat. I want to look at you with you today, this morning and this evening, at a couple of uh, images, passages in the book of Isaiah that speak about Jesus, two distinct pictures of Jesus. And the first one is uh, very prominent throughout this Old Testament book of Jesus as a savior. The actual name Isaiah means God is salvation. And that is the central theme of the whole of the book, how Jesus comes to be the savior of the world. You might ask, what do I need to be saved from? Well, people of Ukraine a couple of years ago probably didn't think they needed much to be saved from, but uh, that was until the tanks started rolling in and the bombs started falling. You see, we all think we're fine until life starts going wrong. Uh, we think that uh, we can manage on our own until we realize that we can't manage on our own and that we need help. And sometimes hard times are actually a blessing in disguise because what they do is that they challenge our spirit of independence and they make us realize that we need help. We need saved sometimes out of situations that we get ourselves into. And that was the case for the nation of Israel. They went through a lot of hard times. But a lot of those hard times were created by choices, bad choices that they have made. And the context of this prophecy of Isaiah is a time in the nation of Israel when they had made bad choices to disobey what God they knew was telling them to do. And as a result, they were carried off into exile as a nation and they were enslaved by an enemy. You would have thought that people would learn their lesson when thing go, things go bad, but it happened again. And Isaiah is speaking about not only the first exile when the nation was taken off to Assyria, but he also now prophetically is talking about the second exile when the nation was taken off to Babylon years later as slaves. Now, in those times, praise God, we don't live in our society in times of uh, visible slavery in the same way, although there is slavery hidden. Uh, in those times, a slave needed to be redeemed. And we need to understand this concept where somebody could come to where those slaves were being sold. Terrible concept, isn't it? But that was the reality in those days. And in order to redeem a slave, a person would have to pay a price. And that price would be paid to the slave owner and they would be redeemed. They would be bought out of slavery. So that was the concept that they understood when that word redeem was, uh, was ever used. And so those twin concepts of redeemer and savior are important background to the passage that I want us to look at uh, this morning. They go hand in hand throughout this book. And Chapter 43 is where I would like to um, take you. It's uh, just the opening verses of this uh, beautiful chapter. And I want to meditate on it with you this morning. And let me read to you those opening verses. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. 
When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Now these assurances and these promises, as you can read, are primarily directed at Israel as the nation. And down through history, we can witness how they have literally been fulfilled time and time again in the nation of Israel. As we've seen miracles of Israel being delivered miraculously by God, can't have been by anyone else. But we need to understand that Israel, everything that's said and promised to Israel, is transferable, according to the book of Galatians, to every believer who is described in that book as the seed of Abraham. So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, then these promises are applicable to you today because you are the seed of Abraham and they are directed at the people of God and we by privilege of coming through Christ are numbered amongst the people of God. Now the way God fulfills his promises is normally through Jesus and we we'll see that as we look at this passage. So before we look at what we're saved out of, I want to consider who it is that actually saves us. You see, Isaiah's concept of salvation can only be understood fully in the light of our New Testament and in our understanding of the person and work of Jesus Christ. So let's piece together what we can learn about salvation by recognizing that this Savior that's being spoken about is completely unique. Let's uh, just take some of these verses and highlight them. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One, the separated one, the different one of Israel, your Savior. I, I am the Lord, verse 11 says. And besides me, there is no Savior. And then as if to emphasize his uniqueness, again in chapter 45, O God of Israel, the Savior, Verse 17, but Israel is saved by the Lord with everlasting salvation. And then again, down in verses 21 and 22, there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. The uniqueness of this Savior, no one else. And contrasted in verse 20 of chapter 45, we have the other gods that the pagan world around them in that time were worshipping. And uh, this is what the writer says, they've no knowledge. They who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. And as we look around us in society today, it's the exact same image as people scurry about wanting to be saved from the circumstances of their lives. But what are they turning to? They're turning to wooden idols. They don't recognize that, but materialism, drugs. They're turning to sexual deviancy. They're turning to a society that cannot save them from the anguish and the pain that's surrounding us. Now, to those of you who may have doubts that Jesus is actually God in human form, Reading these verses can only draw us to a conclusion. And this is what the New Testament says. 
for sh you shall call his name Jesus. That that word in the original language is actually literally Savior. For he will save his people from their sins. Then Acts categorically states there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now that verse is not politically correct in the world in which we're living. In fact, it's a statement that can bring persecution and I dare say in the future prosecution as well. Because it's not acceptable in our increasingly pagan society to say that Jesus is the only way that a person can get to heaven. And I'm worried, I'm concerned, I'm really fascinated at another level. That's how many who claim to be evangelical Bible-believing Christians are just very subtly opening up a back door into heaven, saying that there are other names, that there are other ways. But you cannot look at that verse. If we can have it up again, please. Just keep it up there for a moment. You cannot look at that verse and continue to believe in the authority and the infallibility of Scripture and interpret it any other way than the obvious way that it reads. But there are other evidences. And we move on to some of these verses. He who created you, he who formed you. What does it say? All things were made through him. Who's him? Jesus. For by him all things were created. All things were created through him and for him. Who's Isaiah talking about? Didn't realize it. Talking about Jesus. I have redeemed you. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ. That was the price that was paid to redeem us. The blood of Jesus. To purchase us and bring us out of slavery and into his family. To belong to his family. And then I've called you by name. Who's that? The good shepherd. John chapter 10. He calls his own sheep. By name. And I don't know. Many of you this morning. I don't, don't know where you stand. In relation to. Whether you're. Assured in your heart. That you have been redeemed. You have been brought and bought out of slavery. That you are part of the family of God. That Jesus is your savior. And there may well be a sense of uncertainty in your heart this morning. I want you to be certain because he's calling you. By name. He knows you. He knows all about your life. He knows about those things that you're trying to escape from and he wants to save you from them. And it may well be that as you sit here this morning, you can hear a different voice than my voice. That's his voice. Calling you by name to follow him. But he gives you a choice. 
gives you a choice. You can remain as a slave, a slave to sin, a slave to those habits, a slave to that life. Or you can respond to his call. Be redeemed, be saved. Come out of that slavery into his family. And that reminds me that the Apostle Paul tells us that all the promises of God find their yes, their fulfillment in him, in Jesus. And so it leads me to those specific promises in verse 2 of our passage, we have his saving power spoken of. His saving power is unlimited. Yes, our Savior is unique, but his saving power is unlimited. And it describes some of those areas where we need saved from. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they shall not overcome you. Or overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. I said these words were originally addressed to Israel, and we've seen down through the ages how they've been tested as a nation, and not just the two exiles, but with their persecution, with their isolation in the Middle East, and with the Holocaust, let's face it. And God was promising that He would be there for them as He has been. But these words also apply. To the church. The rivers of testing, the fires of persecution have and continue, continue to assail the church. Maybe not so much in this country yet as it's happening in other countries. I was uh, telling, um, I was telling, I forget, what I, was, oh, I was telling you last night, wasn't I, that uh, I met recently with. Um, a pastor up in Ilfracum near where we live. And uh, he was telling me the wonderful story. Some, you may have seen it on Spotlight. If you get the same television down here as we do. Um, that a, a hotel in Ilfracum has uh, recently received a lot of refugees. Well, most of those refugees are from Iran. And uh, this pastor I was having coffee with was telling me how a few weeks ago, 27 refuge, refugees were baptized in his church. The story is a long story, but the backdrop is uh, one of uh, those families of refugees had to flee Iran because they were Christians. And uh, they started coming to church, they started bringing others with them, and 27 have been converted and, 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 and baptized, and their services are now run both in English and simultaneously translated into Farsi, which, who would have thought of that? That's a uh, you know, God's amazing ways. Uh, but uh, yet they came because of persecution, trials, fire. Just notice the escalation in these trials. Waters become rivers. The fire intensifies into a flame. They're both literal but also symbolic. And throughout the book of Isaiah, there is a recurring theme. If you read it, it's a hard book to read, but if you read it, you'll find that there are uh, continuous references to something that frames their understanding of God's salvation. And it's the story of the exodus from Egypt. And in particular, the crossing of the Red Sea. The miraculous intervention of God. They come to what they see as an insurmountable object in front of them, an obstacle of proportions that was, were impossible for them to negotiate by themselves. And they trust in God and he miraculously intervenes and, and he creates a way where there seemed to be no other way. You see, God's up there in heaven, and he's got a different perspective. He can see the end from the beginning, and he, looking down, could see a way that they couldn't see. God's always like that. You may not see a way through the obstacles that you're facing at the moment. They seem like something that you can't negotiate. And God's saying to you, I can see a way where you see no other way. He can open up a way. 
But as they opened up that way and went through that way and started walking with the chariots of Pharaoh closing in fast behind them, what struck me in that story was this, that we're told that God was with them in the pillar of fire and cloud. And that moved around to be between them and the armies that were coming after them. And they went into the waters through the middle of that river. But as they passed through the rivers, when they looked behind, they didn't see the enemy. They saw the Lord. You see, what we need to remember is that God doesn't always save us from the rivers, but he takes us through the rivers. But he pro promises that when we're called to go through those rivers, we're not alone. He'll be with us. I don't know what you're going through at the moment. But he does. And he assures you. That that obstacle you think is too big to overcome. Those rivers that you're wading through. That's, that you think are going to overwhelm you. Your health problems. Your financial pressures your job issues, your family issues. You're not alone. But not only is there the threat of the river overwhelming you, but it says here, there's the threat of the fire overcoming you and consuming you and its flames. And I'm sure those dear Iranian Christians that, uh, that I referred to have felt the heat of persecution. And there are many more around the world who are walking through those flames today. But I was reflecting and I was looking at my, um, my atlas and I recognized that not very many miles away from the country of Iran, in fact, just over the border in the country of Iraq, I recall the story of three men who were persecuted for their faith and who refused to bow to the government's decrees. And the consequence of that was really quite um, extreme. The consequence of that was that they were taken and because of being persecuted for their faith, they were actually physically bound hand and foot. And they were thrown into a furnace of fire. And the dictator emperor of that country in those days, from a safe distance, stood and watched First of all, the guards that had thrown them in be killed because of the intensity of the flames. But he exclaimed in unbelief that as he looked into the fire, in the midst of the fire, he didn't see three men that were bound. He saw three men that were loosed from their bonds, walking freely, and a fourth man, and he exclaimed, and the fourth man was like a son of the gods. Who was with them? Jesus was with them. Alan Redpath writes this. He says, walking is the pace at which you go when you're not in a hurry when you're not concerned or alarmed, 
when you're not burdened or anxious, then you walk. The old hymn writer captured this, this image beautifully, walking by faith instead of fear. <clears throat> and I quote to you those immortal words, in heavenly love abiding, no change my heart shall fear. And he finishes that uh, hymn, my hope I cannot measure, my path to life is free. My saviour has my treasure and he will walk with me. We were singing earlier about God's refining fire. Sometimes he causes us to walk through those flames. And he uses those flames. It may not be persecution, it may be something else. He uses those flames to, to refine us. To teach us things that we couldn't learn outside the flames. To get us to experience that in the midst of the fire, he is with us. He will protect us. So as I close, let me just put those verses back up again. And let's read them. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, Jacob, he who formed you. O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. He doesn't save us from, but he saves us through. And he promises he'll not let us be overwhelmed or overcome. So we pray together. The psalmist said this, he said, we went through fire and through water. Yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. I, I don't know what it may well be that you're going through this morning, but I believe the Holy Spirit wants to just impress upon you not only that God's with you, but that you will be brought out to a place of abundance that blessing will come even as a result of what you're going through Father God we thank you for your promises we thank you that all of your promises find their fulfillment their yes in Jesus thank you Lord Jesus that you came to save us, to save us from our sin, to save us from hell, to save us from our habits, to save us from ourselves, but to save us day by day from the pressures and the problems of our lives to be with us as our Savior and Redeemer. Thank you, Lord Jesus.